completed since 1997. So the city has hired uh, consultant Will Dan. Carlos Villarreal is with us today and will be giving the presentation um, on the fee study uh, which and the resulting change in fees, which was a recommendation, will be a recommendation going toward to council. Um, I assume most of you are aware, but impact fees are the fee for the development that brings additional impact into the city. More single family homes, more cars are driving, more impact on our sewer, water, and drainage systems, for example. Uh, today, we're just talking about traffic and drainage. Uh, parks fees are being looked at as well, but they're falling a little bit behind. We are not uh, currently adjusting our sewer or water impact fees. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Carlos. And I will add that since we have such a small group it would probably okay to interrupt. Otherwise, if you want to submit questions in the chat box, uh, I'll be looking at that as we go along. Thanks, and you've got it, Carlos. Great, thanks, Larry. Um, so as Larry said, uh, can everyone, first off, can everyone see my screen here? Hopefully this, the screen share is working. Um, my name is Carlos Villarreal, and I am a project manager with Holdan Financial Services. Uh, I've been with the firm for just a little over 15 years now, and my primary focus uh, has been on development impact fees. Um, most recently, in, in your neck of the woods, I worked on the storm drain uh, impact fee update for the town of Windsor. And interestingly enough, uh, the fees actually went down in that situation. Um, today, uh, the fees are not necessarily going down, uh, but I'm here to sort of, you know, walk you through our approach and our analysis and you bring everyone up to speed. Um, like Larry said, feel free to stop and ask questions along the way. Uh, the fees are in a draft form. We, we certainly can make changes to them going forward uh, if, you know, if, if we get uh, the feedback to do so. Um, but that said, we, we, you know, uh, we have been working with staff pretty closely and we, we feel like the fees are in a good enough place to present to you all. Um, so anyway, uh, in the presentation, I'm going to run through a little bit of Impact Fee 101 just to make sure that everyone on the call is on the same page. Um, I will give a high-level look at the different methodologies that we're using for these two Impact Fee categories. I'll run through some of the assum assumptions uh, that generate the fees at, at a pretty high level, and then we can review the fee revenue uh, generated by the fees if they're adopted at the maximum levels. We can uh, take a look at the resulting fee schedules. And finally, I'll present a comparison to some of your neighbors in the region. So again, a little impact fee 101 to start off just so that everyone's on the same page. What are impact fees? Uh, they're a one-time fee uh, charged to new development, typically at the building permit, although some jurisdictions charge it at the certificate of occupancy. Um, and the fees are used to fund the facilities needed to serve new development. So our entire analysis is demonstrating the nexus or the relationship between the facilities and the development that creates demand for facilities. Uh, impact fees are not an ongoing charge. So if you're an existing resident or business in town, uh, you, you are not gonna get charged this fee. Um, again, it's just a one-time fee charge the building permit. And the impact fees are not supposed to be used to fund any ongoing maintenance or op operations costs. They're for those one-time facility needs uh, demanded because of new development. And finally, uh, for facilities that could, sh uh, could serve both existing and new development, the impact fee can only fund new development share of those facilities. So our analysis uh, makes some assumptions about the share of different facilities that we'll, we'll be serving who, and we you know, make it very clear that we're not funding uh, existing facility share of these, or existing development share of these facilities. So in California, it's the Mitigation Fee Act and Government Code 66,000 that lays out the guidelines for how impact fees are to be calculated and how they are to be implemented. Uh, in terms of the calculation, we have to make several findings and our report supports these findings. Uh, we need to show that new development creates the need for these facilities, that new development will benefit from the use of the fee revenue, and that the fees are proportional to new development share of the facility costs. We also need to document the purpose of the fee and how the city plans to use the fee revenue. 
So uh, next, I'm just going to run through, uh, you know, at a high level, how we would conduct an impact fee study. So here's our basic methodology. The first step is we quantify demand for facilities, and that comes in the form of estimates of existing development and future growth. I'll show you our, our estimates in a subsequent slide. Using those uh, estimates of demand, again, uh, de you know, existing and future development, we can identify facility standards, uh, and I will discuss facility standards as well a little bit more in a subsequent slide. We can then uh, identify new facility needs and the cost of those new facilities, and we can allocate a share of those facilities to accommodate growth. Uh, in the case where facilities will be serving both existing and new development, we can identify a share that's needed to serve existing development and therefore cannot be funded through the impact fees. Uh, essentially, any source other than, than the impact fee needs to fund existing development share of those costs. And then finally, we calculate a fee schedule uh, by allocating those costs per unit of new development. So for example, uh, cost per single family and multifamily dwelling units and various non-residential building square feet. So for the two uh, uh, impact fees that we're updating today, the storm drain facilities fee and the private facilities fee, we have a couple of different approaches. Uh, for the storm drains facilities fee, we are going to use an existing facility standard approach. Here's where we quantify the city's investment in existing facilities and relate that to existing demand. So we end up with a cost per equivalent dwelling unit uh, and, and so under this approach, we're asking new development to maintain that same relationship and contribute to facilities at the same level that existing development has contributed to date. For the traffic facilities fee, uh, the city already had to be built because of new development. So we were able to identify a share of each development that can be attributable to growth, and then new development fully funds its share standard because the, the planned facilities are driving the fee calculation. So uh, as I mentioned before, I will be sharing with you our growth projections. Uh, here are the, the estimates of existing development and our uh, projected increase to build out. So uh, the estimates for 2020 for uh, residents and dwelling units come from data from the uh, Sonoma County GIS department uh, to estimate the existing non-residential building square feet. And then we also had data from the city with regards to their existing hotel rooms and lodging rooms. The increase for, uh, for uh, residents and dwelling units is informed by the city's general plan uh, EIR uh, update. And then we, uh, on the non-residential side of things, the city identified potential uh, non-residential um, growth or the uh, potential lots that could be developed and estimated the, the capacity of those, uh, of those properties. Uh, and same goes for the hotel rooms. So uh, we were able to estimate you know, the rough, rough amount of, of development that could be accommodated within the city's uh, uh, borders. So when it comes to quantifying demand for traffic facilities, we think about trip generation. Uh, and what we, we, we take that a little step further here. Um, so as you can see over to the right, we have the PM peak hour trip rates and that, that's really the, the main driver of demand. But we also like to make two adjustments. The first adjustment that we make is for pass by trips. So trips that are less than a half mile in length, we uh, don't allocate those trips to any particular land use because you're just passing by and, and you're not the main trip generator there. So we, uh, and, and this is particularly relevant for commercial. You think of a gas station, a ton of trips go through there, but no one's making their primary trip to the gas station. Um, so we, we, we make an estimate for uh, pass by trips and remove that from the calculation. And then we also adjust for trip lengths. So not all trips are created equal. Some trips are really long, some trips are shorter. The really long trips contribute more congestion than the short trips do. And so we make an adjustment for the average trip length. Uh, and uh, we wrap that trip length, uh, pass by trip adjustment, and the PM peak uh, trip hour or PM peak hour trip estimates into what we call the trip demand factor. And again, you can think of the trip demand factor as a weighted estimate of traffic generation for each type of land use. So your residential dwelling units and your non-residential building square feet or hotel rooms, and. Uh, also, you can look at the relative amount of trip demand generated by each land use, and this ultimately informs the fee level for each different type of land use. So the more trip demand you generate, the higher your fee will be relative to the other land uses. For storm drain, we think about demand in terms of impervious surface. So we took uh, estimates of dwelling units or 1,000 square feet of non-residential space 
uh, per acre from the general plan. We also have estimates of average impervious surface per acre from documents from the California EPA. And then we can estimate the amount of impervious square feet generated by each type of dwelling unit or, or non-residential uh, building square feet or hotel rooms. We then compare the impervious square footage generated by each land use to that of a single family unit, and that gives us our equivalent dwelling unit. So this uh, basically relates the amount of impervious surface generated by each land use to that of a single family unit. And again, uh, the differences in the EDU factors generate the differences in the fee schedule. So uh, I'm sure a lot of folks are interested in what is the city planning to fund with the traffic facilities fee? So here are the projects that are driving the calculation of that fee. Um, the first project on the list, uh, I, I wanted to make a note that uh, de developer contributions for a uh, share of the project have already been identified from some developments and the county has also identified some uh, revenue for this project. Uh, beyond that, new development is driving the need for the project. So the total project cost net those developer contributions and the county's contribution are allocated to the impact fee. Um, so you can see that's about 72% uh, of the total project cost. For all of the other projects, they will be benefiting both existing and new development. And so because of that reason, we can't fully allocate them to the impact fee, but new development can certainly pay its share. So the 17.3% that you see there for all of the other projects, that's based on new development share of total trips at the projected build out. So we took the estimates of existing and new development uh, for each unit of development, for example, for each single family home or each thousand square feet of commercial space, we multiplied those units by the trip demand factors that I presented a couple slides ago. And that get, gives us an estimate of trip demand today, trip demand in the future, and then we can take the difference between the two and that's new development share of trip demand. In this case, based on the growth projections, again, driven by the general plan and the city's estimate of de development potential, um, in terms of trips, a new development comprises about 17.3% of total trips at the planning horizon. So consequently, we allocate 17.3% of these projects that ben benefit both existing and new development to the impact fee. At the end of the day, uh, the city has identified about $29.5 million worth of projects, uh, but of that, only about $8.8 .8 million is being allocated to the impact fee. The rest will be funded through non-impact fee sources. Um, so what you can see going on at the bottom of the table is we have the cost allocated to the impact fee. We divide that by the increase in PMP hour trip demand, and that gives us our cost per trip, which then drives the fee calculation. For storm drain facilities, if you recall, I mentioned we use an existing facility standard approach. Under this approach, we value the city's investment in all of the storm drain facilities that it has completed to date and that it owns. Um, so Kurt, I don't know if Kurt's on the call with us yet, but uh, he helped us, oh, there he is. He helped us uh, uh, estimate the total value of the system, the replacement cost of all of the city city's storm drain facilities. They're summarized here, but in the, in the full report, there will be detailed tables with the full listing of all the different storm drain pipes, inlets, jun junction boxes, et cetera. And we estimated the total replacement cost of the city's storm drain system. We then use the EDU factors that I presented earlier, again, multiplied by the estimates of existing development. So what's your existing uh, demand for storm drains and divided those EDU or to, divided the total replacement cost by the existing EDUs to give us our existing standard per EDU, uh, which is the $5,612 at the bottom of the table. You can think about this is on a single family dwelling unit basis, what is the investment that the city has made in storm drain facilities? So going forward, uh, if the city implements the fee at the maximum justified rate, uh, we're simply asking new development to maintain that same investment in the storm drain facilities, and the city would then spend that fee revenue to expand the capacity of the storm drain system. This next slide shows the impact fee revenue projections. So should the city adopt the draft fees at the maximum justified rate that we've identified, 
this uh, shows you what the impact fee revenue would be. For traffic facilities, as I touched on earlier, as you can see, the impact fee revenue does not fully fund the facilities. The city would need to come up with about $20.7 million through build out to fully fund the, the, uh, the facilities identified. For storm drain facilities, because we're using the existing uh, inventory standard, uh, all of that fee revenue will be spent on uh, projects that would benefit new development. So the $4.7 million generated all needs to be spent on capacity expanding storm drain projects. So what does this look like for your, your impact fee program? Uh, at the maximum justified level, a single family fee uh, for, for traffic facilities would be $4,588. And for the storm drain facilities fee, a single family home would pay $5,724. So again, th these are the maximum justified impact fees. The city could always implement something less, but it cannot uh, implement anything higher than, than these numbers. So we also wanted to give you a little context for the region for how these fees compare. And I realize there's a lot going on in this slide, but I think it's important to kind of understand a few things. So um, I've bolded the two fees across the board uh, that we're updating. So we're only looking at streets and we're only looking at storm, but obviously it's the full, you know, the full menu of impact fees that developers pay. And so it's helpful to understand uh, amongst these comparison cities what the total number is for impact fees that fund facilities. Um, so a few notes. Um, first, uh, I, I do need to mention we are updating the park impact fee, but it's not included in this round of the updates. So uh, for both Healdsburg existing and draft numbers, you, you, you do see a park fee, uh, but we, that will be coming later. Um, some cities charge impact fees in zones. So for example, Santa Rosa, uh, their park fee varies by which quadrant of the city you are in. So uh, in order to demonstrate the range of possible fees that you might, you might be paying, um, I'm showing a low scenario and a high scenario for a couple cities for Santa Rosa and for Roner Park, again, because they charge fees in zone and the total number would vary depending on which zone you are ultimately in. Also note that uh, we really wanted to be able to focus on the streets and storm drain fees, but some cities have a catch-all impact fee. Again, for example, Santa Rosa and Runner Park, uh, they have a fee uh, in Santa Rosa, it's called your capital facilities fee. In Runner Park, I believe it's called a public facilities fee, but it's one fee that funds various different types of facilities. So in Santa Rosa, it funds streets, traffic signals, interchanges, bike paths, and storm drains. And so there's no real way to break out what portions of that fee go to what. It's just a lump sum that, that are paid. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. So if you look at Santa Rosa and say, well, hey, they don't charge a streets fee. They actually do charge a streets fee. It's just not broken up into the, the neat categories that the city of Healdsburg uh, charges them in. So uh, yeah, so with that, you can see where the city or the, the Healdsburg's existing and draft fees are. They are within the range of what your, your neighbors are charging, but certainly it is a wide range. You have Sonoma on the low end, uh, about $21,000 per door, all the way up to Windsor, about $49,000 per door. So the region does you know, see a, quite a wide range in the impact fees that are charged. We also wanted to take a look at uh, what, the, what was happening on the non-residential side of things. So for the non-residential comparison, Rather than just calculate what the fees are per thousand square per thousand square feet, we, we wanted to use a real life example because for some fee categories, not the ones that we're calculating today, but say for example, water, some, some cities charge a fee per meter size and other charge charge a fee per thousand square feet. So we just wanted to have a, a project prototype that we could calculate the fees for and then compare the fees for that prototype across all of the jurisdictions. So in this case, uh, the city of Petaluma recently had a 11,000 square foot warehouse project and that's what we calculated the fees for. Um, so you can see here, we had the city of Healdsburg existing in draft fees. Uh, the, the big note I would say here is that you can see the streets fee is increasing significantly. Uh, and then we're comparing your fees to all of the, uh, the comparison jurisdictions here. Again, uh, the fees are within the range, but it is quite a wide range for this type of development prototype. Uh, again, Sonoma is on the low end, 
and I would say Windsor or Petaluma in this case is on the high end. Uh, and both the city of Healdsburg's existing and draft fees are within the range, but it is, it is a wide range. Finally, we also wanted to have a commercial prototype. Again, this is based on a recent project in the city of Healdsburg, a little less than 40,000 square feet of a commercial project. Uh, and you can see, similar to the last fee, that there, or the, the last prototype, there's a big increase in our draft uh, streets fee. Um, certainly, though, this, both the existing and draft fees fall within the range of what the, uh, is on the low end, uh, and Petaluma is on the high end of things. So uh, with that, before we get into qu any questions you might have, just wanted to lay out a few policy options that the City Council has as, at its disposal as it considers the impact fee update. The first is that the City can always adopt something less than the maximum justified amount. Uh, you know, the maximum justified amount is, is more or less a theoretical number uh, that represents new development share of the facilities, but it doesn't take into account whether or not those fees are feasible or not. So as a policy option, the City Council can always adopt something less than the maximum justified number, but nothing more. Uh, the second bullet point that I have here is that because the city, it, it's been so long since the city has updated its fees, naturally you're going to see a large increase just due to the cost of construction of projects in general. Uh, and in these situations, uh, you know, it could be, uh, it, it, sometimes it makes sense for a city to phase, phase in the free fee increases over several years. Now the Mitigation Fee Act does not speak to this, so there's no set number of years or set percentage to raise the fees every year. It, it's, it's certainly a case-by-case -case basis that the city council could, could decide on. Uh, but what it could do if the city, city council decides to do this is it, it could give developers some certainty as to what the fee schedule is gonna be over several years while ratcheting up the fees to get to the level that they need to be in order to fund new development share of the facilities. And then my final uh, policy option or more of a recommendation here is that the city should annually adjust the fees for inflation uh, we all know construction costs have been increasing pretty pretty uh, quickly lately. Uh, and so if the city uh, adds a, an inflation adjustment to the fees, uh, that way, you know, several years down the road, we don't end up in the situation where the fees are under collecting for the facilities that they need to fund. Um, so that's uh, more of an implementation uh, suggestion there. And with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to, to answer any questions you, you may have. And I know Larry and Kurt from the city are also on the line to answer uh, questions as well. Carlos, so uh, we do have one question in the chat box. Maybe good for Kurt to answer this one. Uh, the question from Eric is, if you're vacating a business, rebuilding that same business at a different location, uh, assuming everything else is equal, how does that work as far as impact fees? I think the same could be said for, you know, demoing a single family home and building a new one. Yeah, hi everyone. This is Kurt Bates, Public Works Department. So with impact fees and capacity fees, they run with the land. So they pay for the impact of the project on the land, on the property. So in the case of traffic, if you're moving your operation from one site to another site, you're creating new trips on another site and you have to pay impact fees for the new trips created on that site. And on the old site, in theory, that site has those trips in the bank, let's say. So if someone was to move into the old site and have the same operation, then no additional fees are required. But if the old site was redeveloped to a higher intensity use, then there would be additional fees required for the old site with the credit given to the fees that have been historically, or the trips that have been historically seen there. Does that make sense? Thank you, Kurt. Are there any other questions? I have a, just a generic question. If, uh, in terms of the, the trip costs, how it, it, it sounds like, are you taking into account, um, you know, the actual use for the, for the fees? It sounded like the 40,000 square foot warehouse, you know, if it's an Amazon warehouse, that's one kind of trip generation. And if it's a, a tank manufacturer, that's a different kind of trip generation. Are they adjusted in any way, depending upon the use? 
yeah so we uh we don't have uses for you know a smorgasbord of, of land uses but uh like i presented back here let me pull up the, the slide um we have these generalized land use categories so certainly uh let's go up here uh the land uses uh that the fees we calculated for are shown here so a, a general commercial land use a general office land use a general industrial land use and, and these, these are the, the land use categories that that a, a development project would have to fit under uh and, and these are the assumptions that we've made for them um that said uh you know we do end up with that cost per trip at the end of the day and and one option that we've done for for some clients and certainly this is at the discretion of the city is that if you have a um, a development project that generates a wildly different amount of trips than is indicated by these trip factors that we've calculated here, uh, you can use that cost per trip multiplied by another trip demand factor to come up with a particular fee for that land use. And so uh, several, several clients of ours have sort of an appeals process where if you, uh, if you think your, your project, say it's a commercial project, but you know you're going to generate far fewer trips than, than the assumptions here, uh, you could have a, a licensed traffic engineer come up with a, a traffic, uh, a, a, an estimate of, of trips for your particular special land use, and then recalculate the fee that way. So that that is an option. But as it stands now, th these are the land use categories that that we have calculated uh, fees for. And and then if I'm developing a, a fourplex versus a single family dwelling, am I paying four um, fees? So fourplex. Yeah, a, a fourplex, you would pay the, the multifamily fee per dwelling unit times four. So it's it, the multifamily fee is less than the single family fee uh, because we assume uh, fewer trip generation. Uh, but yeah, in a, in a four, you know, four units attached, uh, you, you would pay the, the fee per multifamily unit times four. Does that also apply for the storm drain? Yes. Why, why would... Uh fourplex of 4,000 square feet have four times the fee of a single family dwelling of 4,000 square feet? It, it, it wouldn't have four times the fee of a single family dwelling. Uh, we assume that each uh, dwelling unit in an attached building ha generates about, uh, you, you know, 40% of the impervious surface of one single family dwelling unit. So it would be four times the 40% of a single family unit. So it'll be 1.6 rather than 1.0. Correct. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is Eric Cedric. Uh, could I go back to Kurt uh, and his response to my specific question about the relocation? Kurt, I'm curious to if staff, number one, baseball and Carlos just explain an appeal process, if staff is going to re recommend some sort of an appeal process, depending on special circumstances. In my case, I'm, I'm curious because my present site is in the middle of town and has a much more significant impact than my new location, which is on the outskirts of town and is, is going to be a significant relief of congestion and and traffic throughout the southern part of Healdsburg. Is there a process to factor that into whatever the the traffic fees impact fees end up being? So thanks for that, Eric. And you bring up a good point. And we haven't evaluated that uh, as of yet. So I think that's certainly something we'll take as uh, very good feedback from this meeting and we'll need to discuss it and, and figure out if we have some sort of uh, approach that can be allowed in special circumstances like that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, I think as long as we're all here and we have a few minutes, Kurt, if you would address uh, the question that we talked about at the first meeting regarding drainage. And if someone is going to mitigate 
for drainage on site? Sure. So what we talked about at the first meeting, there were questions about this was if a project is required to treat its stormwater on site per the city's regulations and the state water board regulations, or if the project is required to detain the water, so control the amount of runoff that's leaving the site. What a lot of agencies do and, and what Healdsburg hadn't done previously is have an allowance in the impact fee structure where basically if, if you detain your water on site to pre-project conditions, so the post-project drainage is equal to the pre-project drainage, then in theory, your project's not creating any additional runoff, so there's no nexus for the city to charge an impact fee. So that is something that we're going to be allowing in, with this fee update. You're, you're going to have future meetings on uh, the other impact fees? Yes, the the parks fee. Uh, I don't know the exact schedule. Uh, maybe maybe Carlos knows, but we're at least a couple months behind. Uh, before we address that, or I let Carlos address that. Uh, this fee increase is uh, going to council on January nineteenth. We wanted to have these two meetings in advance so that uh, nothing is a surprise to anyone. It's being recorded today. So it is my assumption that city council will view this so that they understand a little bit going in. Uh, if you have additional comments, feel free to e email them to either me or Kurt, and we'll make sure that that goes into our council presentation because that's a big part of what we're doing here is trying to reach out and get people's comments so that we're fairly representing that to council. So with that, uh, Carlos, do you know what the current schedule is for the parks fee? Yeah, I, I, that I, I think the, the schedule has not really been nailed down at this point. We have a very early draft, but there are still um, significant issues to work out w within the department. So yeah, we're, we're not quite ready to share anything yet, but uh, my understanding is we, we wanna go through that. It's the same process we're going through now for the, for the traffic and storm fee with the parks fee as well, so that everyone can be fully apprised of of what's going on there. But yeah, as of right now, I don't think we have any dates for any for sharing any any drafts or anything like that at, at this point. Sewer, water, any of those? Uh, you gonna answer, Kurt? Well, I, I can speak to that. Um, what I do know is that our utility department is in the very beginning stages of doing a rate study for sewer and water. But that's for utility billing. That's not for development capacity fees. So my, my understanding is at this point, there is no plan to do an update of capacity fees uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, that's correct. The, the impact fees that we're talking about today, like I said, haven't been updated since 97. The sewer and water capacity fees are more recent. Just a general question: the, the, with a full city build out, with the kind of you know unknowns and vacant land that we have, since we haven't done our general plan update, we don't know you know what the development build out will ultimately be where SIR is and south of town. Is it an anticipated that our sewer, our, our new sewer treatment facility, will handle that whatever? we come up with, with improvements in town, south of the bridge, as well as up the Healdsburg corridor? A, an excellent question. I can't answer at the moment, other than uh, we're not going to be constructing things that we can't manage. Uh, a lot of work needs to go into the development of the South area. And you know that process is slowly starting. So if there are no more questions, uh, again, you can you can email me or Kurt at any time going forward. 
January 19th, again, is when this is going to council. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Hopefully it was helpful and uh, have a good evening.